All right, so I'll talk a bit more about um, some of the clinical outcomes that we looked into uh, with all our experience uh, in sclerotherapy. I will focus exclusively on the renal cyst that we treated because we also uh, did a number of um, liver cyst decompression. So kidney cyst decompression in ADPKD. So some of this information you already know, of course. Uh, TKV is very important. Um, as a prognostic biomarker in ADPKD, and it expands on average by about 5% per year during adult life. And patients with a TKV that is above 1,500 milliliters, in particular, are at highest risk of developing end-stage renal disease. So in a recent review uh, of our own cohort, uh, more than 50% of our patients with ADPKD had at least one large kidney cyst. We defined that as a cyst uh, that was at least five centimeters in uh, one of its diameters. And these cysts are believed to impede regional kidney blood flow and also urine flow and thus cause uh, potential damage eventually. So sclerotherapy, uh, as mentioned by Dr. Shlomovich, is a well-known procedure. Uh, it's an outpatient, minimally invasive, imaging-guided uh, intervention, uh, which in previous literature was shown to ablate large symptomatic kidney cysts in ADPKD successfully, but without that a study showing a significant difference in kidney volume change. So this was back in the 90s already. And a number of uh, different um, uh, agents have been used for sclerotherapy. Uh, ethanol used to be uh, the predominant one, but uh, we realized that sodium tetradecyl sulfate, or STS, might be more interesting. So why is that? Uh, one relatively recent study showed that uh, when looking at targeted ablation of simple renal cysts, STS, foam sclerotherapy, actually provided similar rates of successful cyst ablation, uh, but with fewer side effects uh, in comparison with ethanol. So it's become um, the one agent that we use predominantly in our um, experimental therapy. So uh, the findings of uh, our clinical pilot study uh, have recently been accepted. Uh, for publication in kidney medicine, so um, that paper is in press and will hopefully uh, be published uh, later this year. And I will essentially uh, touch upon some of the main, um, uh, main findings in this paper. So our rationale was that uh, by permanently ablating large kidney cysts, foam sclerotherapy could be used to reduce TKV and also potentially re relieve the pressure effects from cyst compression uh, to improve regional renal blood and urine flow. Uh, the end goal being, of course, to delay progression of ADPKD. So this was really a feasibility study. We wanted to look uh, if uh, home scale therapy with STS could be used as a potential treatment uh, for ADPKD, and we looked at its effectiveness on TKD reduction, but also its safety and tolerability. So the methods were relatively simple. Uh, we used 3% STS growth therapy to target, generally speaking, two to three large cysts in either one or both kidneys of study patients. Um, we measured creatinine clearance um, at a 24 organ collection and also kidney volume by MRI or CT scan before and after each intervention. And creatinine clearance was corrected for baseline urinary creatinine excretion rate to make sure that would be uh, comparable uh, in the follow-up of individual patients. Easy to compare, that is, in the follow-up of these patients. So this is a study flow chart showing that uh, we recruited, we included patients recruited between November 2014 and August 2017. Initially, we had 68 patients, all of them diagnosed with ADPKD formally and with one or more large cysts. Uh, two of them had to be excluded because in one case there was a uh, there was rupture of the target cyst, and also in the other patient we noticed. Um, an episode of AKI due to contrast nephropathy right before sclerotherapy, and that could have biased the findings. So all in all, 66 uh, cases uh, were retained for analysis, and of these 66 patients, 41, so roughly two-thirds, had mass effect symptoms, uh, such as typical uh, bloating, abdominal pain, back pain, et cetera. Uh, the other were recruited mainly to see if there would be a, a role in um, reducing total kidney volume and potentially also stabilizing kidney function so asymptomatic patients. So uh, these are the patient characteristics. You can see that patients had uh, an average age of 52 years. We had 45.5% males, 54.5% females, and the baseline serum creatinine was around 95 micromoles per liter. The baseline measured creatinine clearance was 85 uh, mils per minute, and baseline TKD was around 2,000 uh, milliliters. 
So interestingly, when looking at mutation class, you can see that there was actually a large proportion of patients with a mutation PKD2, so about 41%, which is higher than what would be expected in a general cohort of patients with APKD. And PKD1 only accounted for about, um, so 35% uh, of these patients. Uh, we also had about 23% of patients with no mutation uh, detected. So this is uh, really, um, I guess, the most important slide um, of this part of the presentation. So um, when comparing targeted versus non-targeted kidneys, uh, we saw that there was a significant decrease by about 22% um, post versus pre-sclerotherapy um, in the targeted kidneys, and there was also an increase by about 3% in the non-targeted kidneys post and both changes were um, uh, significant statistically. And this uh, happened across um, a duration of 13 months in between uh, pre and post scans. We had a small subgroup of patients with improved renal function. Uh, I will go over them. As you can see, they were fairly young overall. Uh, they had different types of mutation. And actually, their baseline uh, creatinine clearance tended to be relatively high, but there was a change that persisted over follow-up up to 24 mils per minute in one patient. Um, and as you can see, this was over at least one year of follow-up. Uh, interestingly, the baseline TKD was not very high for at least two of them. And there was a reduction in TKD of uh, 30 and even 51% in two of these patients. And this actually correlated with a change in the male clinic risk category from 1D to 1C and 1C to 1B. So I think this is fairly interesting. Uh, we, we talked about whether um, recategorizing patients after sclerotherapy means that their risk is, in fact, different. But it's kind of reassuring to see that with at least some of our patients, we managed to see a, a, significant, a decreased GKV significant enough to actually result in a uh, change in the risk category. So if we look at the change in risk category in the, in the overall cohort, not just in those four patients, 14% um, of our patients could be categorized as being in 1B, 54.5% uh, in 1C, so the majority of them, 30.8% in 1D, and then roughly 1.5% uh, in 1E. And four of these patients reduced their risk class post sclerotherapy. They went from 1D to 1C, six went from 1C to 1B, two from 1B to 1A, and interestingly, one patient actually went from 1C to 1A, but after two separate treatments. So this means that there was reduction of at least one risk class in 20% of all patients. Uh, the procedure was well tolerated overall, so we did notice that about 14% of our patients experienced pain after the procedure. Generally, these patients did not require analgesia. Five of them did. And two of them actually continued to have pain for one month or more. But I would say that after a thorough investigation, we couldn't really establish a clear association with the sclerotherapy itself. So it might have been uh, separate causes as well. In one case, uh, there was short-term intermittent hematuria self-resolving. And then we had three potential infectious complications, so about 4.5% one patient with low-grade fever and sore throat five days after sclerotherapy. And in this patient's case, uh, cyst fluid culture, urine culture, and blood culture were all negative. In the second case, one clinical picture of pyelonephritis was also identified on the day of the follow-up se session. And the CT scan suggested an infectious process surrounding the treated cyst, but no actual cyst culture was done. So we never really confirmed that it was cyst infection or not, but radiologically it was compatible. And then the last patient was pretty clear cut. So one confirmed case of cyst infection with a positive fluid culture. So two fairly, um, I would say, clear cut complications. The first one is less obvious uh, from an infectious perspective, I mean. Um, this shows you the changes in patient reported symptoms. So patients filled out a questionnaire with uh, three different categories of um, mass effect induced uh, manifestations after sclerotherapy. You had flank and back pain, abdominal pain, and abdominal distension. So there's actually some overlap in between these three, these three graphs because some patients uh, had no baseline symptoms, some had one type of symptom, 
and some had multiple types, so flank pain and abdominal pain, abdominal distension and abdominal pain, so there was some degree of overlap. If you look at those who had baseline symptoms, you can actually see that the majority of them did in fact experience some degree of improvement in their symptoms, either mild, moderate, or significant. So let's look at some interesting case uh, illustrations uh, that show different outcomes in patients with different uh, phenotypes of, of ADPKD. So here we have a 31-year-old female with a protein truncating PKD1 mutation, a pre uh, sclerotherapy volume of uh, about one, one liter. And so one massive cyst was uh, treated in uh, the upper mid-pole of the right kidney uh, successfully. As you can see, it's uh, virtually gone um, uh, in follow-up imaging. And there was a reduction of 30% of, uh, of TKV. And here, interestingly, uh, the baseline creatinine clearance actually went up steadily. And up to 14 months post-intervention remained higher compared to baseline. So here we have a 46-year-old female with a PKD2 mutation. Um, so here you can see that the uh, baseline TKE was somewhat higher, around 1,800 milliliters. Uh, one large cyst uh, was treated around the lower pole of the right kidney. Um, and once again, uh, the treatment was quite successful, though uh, the decrease in TKE was not impressive, only 5%. And we did see some fluctuation in the creatinine clearance with some trend suggesting an increase uh, up to 17 months post-intervention. Uh, uh, post now, the following two cases are, um, yeah, are a bit different. So here we see an older patient, 70 years old. Uh, she has a protein trunk in APKD1 mutation and a very high baseline TKV, almost five liters. Uh, we went for this, for two different cysts um, in the upper pole of both kidneys, and though they were um, well treated with a decrease of 13% in the kidney volume, that um, predictably didn't really impact on kidney function at all, uh, given the more severe nature of her disease. And then the last case, a 59-year-old male, so once again, a slightly uh, older adult, uh, with a PKD2 mutation and a baseline TKV of about uh, two liters. So one large cyst uh, was secreted in the midpole of the right kidney uh, that induced a decrease of 8%. And despite that, we noticed um, a uh, continuous decrease in um, the measured creatinine clearance. So it did not appear to really uh, impact, at least on the patient's uh, renal function. So in conclusion, foam scale therapy provides an effective and safe means for TKD reduction, but in selected patients with uh, ADPKD, targeted kidney volume reduction may improve kidney function in some, but not all patients. And it appears that factors such as location and size of the ablated cyst, as well as the disease stage, may affect changes in GFR um, post-intervention. So we think that uh, patients with a lower TKV and more easily accessible cysts, possibly younger patients as well, may benefit more from this therapy, but I think more investigation uh, needs to get done. What's also interesting is that foam scale therapy can also improve specific compressive symptoms in symptomatic patients. Uh, and once again, we'll have to see if, these, um, if this improvement persists in, uh, in the very long term. Um, so what's coming now is that uh, we've started recruiting patients for uh, before and after trial to examine the effects of kidney volume reduction on renal blood flow and GFR in PKD patients by ablation of large non-exophytic kidney cysts using uh, paramino hippurate and iohexyl clearance, and this will give us a more precise idea as to whether really this procedure can improve renal blood flow and, and kidney function by more uh, sensitive um, measurements. So I would just like to, uh, oh, can I go back? just like to uh, acknowledge Dr. Ho's uh, help for um, essentially uh, establishing this, uh, this procedure, uh, which we have continued to uh, implement in the past few years. So thank you very much.